So I'm always happy to talk about talking to athletes uh, with heart problems, but I'm particularly happy to be having this conversation in a session on ECG screening. And there's really two reasons for that. First of all, I always enjoy these sessions. They're, I always learn a lot as I did today. And also, it's so controversial that there's often a chance that someone's actually going to get hurt. And so you've got, you know, like kind of like ice hockey, NASCAR, you never know like what's going to happen. But on a more serious note, this debate has been going on for a long time. Before I knew this was a TED Talk, thank you, Eugene, thank you, Savannah, I prepared a slide set, and my first slide was showing all of the debates that have raged in the literature, from the one uh, Dr. Kelly showed us in 2007 circulation, New England Journal, Heart Rhythm, there have been huge numbers of debates on this uh, subject. But the debate ends at the test. So whether, whatever side of this debate you're on, whether you think, whoever you think won this debate, whether you think we should be just doing h and or we should be doing EKGs, if you think your method works and you think there's a reason for doing it, then you're going to be identifying individuals with cardiac disease because that's the whole purpose of screening. And so what are we going to do now what? And that now what question, I think, is usually pretty much ignored. We just we get as far as the test, we say who won the debate, and then we're done. But people can get, but in addition to uh, ECG screening, of course, we're also identifying athletes with cardiac disease through other forms of screening, family cascade screening for a relative who's been diagnosed, maybe an athlete with symptoms even after a cardiac arrest. So when I first looked at the title, Talking to the Athlete with Cardiac Disease, I started in initially thinking about how do we talk to the athlete with, cardiac, with uh, heart disease. But before we get to the how, we really need to get to the question, can we talk to the athlete with cardiac disease? Should we be talking to the athlete with cardiac disease? And then what is there to say? So until quite recently, there really was almost nothing to say to the, adult, uh, to the uh, athlete diagnosed with cardiac disease. And to even have a talk at the ACC on talking to an athlete with cardiac disease is fairly radical. So most people are probably familiar with the 2005 Bethesda Conference uh, recommendations that are, is an encyclopedia of uh, cardiac disease from AC, APCs to WPW and everything in between that tells you if you've got this, you can play, if you've got this, you can't. So in ASD, no pulmonary hypertension, you're good. ASD with mild pulmonary hypertension, you're out. Long QT3, you could play. Long QT1 or HCM or, or uh, presence of an ICD, you were relegated to 1A activities. So what are 1A activities? Uh, most people here know the letters and the numbers uh, represent the static and dynamic components of the exercise. So 1A was the lowest static, lowest dynamic. Uh, basically, billiards, bowling, or uh, golf uh, was uh, recommended. So the basically dichotomous binary yes-no uh, style of the 2005 uh, recommendations really supported a paternalistic view of whether or not athletes should play, both for physicians and for schools making decisions. You're in, you're out, not a lot to really discuss. And the law upheld the right of schools to make that sort of binary decision based on, uh, based on the criteria, on the Bethesda guidelines. Uh, many people here are likely familiar with the Nick Knapp case. Nick Knapp was a basketball player who had a cardiac arrest in high school and got an ICD. He already had a scholarship to Northwestern, and they, they honored his scholarship, but they wouldn't let him play basketball. And he sued, uh, he sued Northwestern, he initially won, and then Northwestern appealed, and, they lost, and Nick Knapp lost in the appeal. And the rationale, the crux of the matter, the crux of the, the decision, was that Northwestern had acted in a reasonable, rational way based on, uh, on substantial evidence. And the evidence was uh, very explicitly outlined in the case that basically was the uh, opinion of the treating physician, the consultants, and very specifically the published guidelines. So Nick Knapp codified that you could, a school could use a binary yes-no based on the guidelines to, uh, to make this decision. So until recently, if you wanted to have a conversation about uh, participation in sports after a diagnosis of a cardiac disease, it was pretty short. You basically said, hey, I hear there's a great bowling alley down the street, and maybe you can sell your hockey stick on eBay. And that was really the extent of the, of the conversation. But since 2005, there have been really three currents or uh, societal uh, 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 shifts that have changed the way we think about this, um, and have, they have changed the way the 2015 guidelines are written, and they also change the way we talk to patients. And those three are, uh, are the, the, and, and those three are first is the uh, the actual development of some data. In 2005, the recommendations were based purely on expert opinion. 
thinking about what might be the risks of, uh, of activity in these specific diseases. And in the absence of data, that's really all you have, is you have to take the people that know most about the disease and see what they think. But since that time, there have been several um, studies that have actually followed athletes who were playing, and I'll get to the actual findings uh, in a couple minutes. The second, uh, the second uh, societal current is the increasing recognition and acceptance of the fact that data are not perfect and that our knowledge are most often not perfect. And an acceptance of this is partly what has driven the ACC's um, classification system of recommendations. So you have your class one recommended, your 2A uh, it may be reasonable, 2B may be considered, class three not recommended. And the level of evidence, level of evidence A, two RCTs, et cetera. So we, we, we have to accept the fact that we're dealing with evidence that is imperfect. And finally, the third societal current has been the recognition of the importance of shared decision making and the fact that patients have a right to make decisions and in fact it's an ethical imperative that, uh, that, we, uh, that we allow them to do so. Um, so to start now uh, with the data, um, the first uh, study that was published that was a, uh, was a retrospective uh, study of patients with long QT that's already been touched on by, by Brian that Mike Ackerman and his group published, 130 patients with long QT, 130 athletes who'd been diagnosed with long QT and continued to play. Um, they, there were no adverse events. There was a single arrhythmia in a patient who already had an ICD and was already known to be at high risk. And so no one who was not known to already be at high risk had an event um, despite continuing to play. Um, as there was a similar series that came out from CHOP by Aziz and Shah later on that was another 103 very similar uh, findings. We published the first prospective study of athletes. Actually, I should say there have been studies of PVCs in athletes were the only prospective uh, studies previously. Where we identified uh, athletes who had received ICDs and were continuing to play. The first report of 372 was published in uh, 2013. We have presented the final uh, data on 440, of whom 77 were varsity type athletes. And what we found was that there were no primary negative outcomes. There were no, cardi no uh, resuscitated arrests, no death, no injuries, um, despite playing with uh, ICDs. The third important place where the data has increased uh, is unfortunately going in the other direction for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Hugh Calkins' group and others have shown that uh, individuals with ARVC who do endurance sports develop heart failure sooner, have worse arrhythmias, what have you, and that they, uh, their outcome actually improves if they stop uh, sports. There remain essentially no data on vigorous uh, exercise and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So next, uh, next uh, subject, uh, shared decision making. How many people in this room have had a shared decision making office visit? Anybody raise their hand? How many people in this room have talked to your patient about an AFib ablation, a TAVR, or a cath? Probably everyone. So if you've had that conversation, you've probably had a shared decision-making uh, conversation. It's, it's, it's an important concept, but it's also a bit of a buzzword. So the definition of patient-centered care and shared decision-making by the Institute of Med Medicine, I'm going to read a quote, is the active engagement of patients in their healthcare decisions and responsiveness to the patient's preferences, needs, and values the role of the clinician is to describe the risk and benefits of the options available, and the patient expresses their preferences and values. And, um, you know, that's obviously really good. It's kind of motherhood and apple pie, and I think, you know, it's hopefully something that we were all really doing all along. Um, the first time the concept of shared decision making was used explicitly to think about athletes with um, cardiac disease that I'm aware of was in Mike Ackerman's uh, report in JAMA, where a big piece of that article talks about the counseling process that they went through um, to allow these, or to, uh, I shouldn't say allow, that's a sort of a paternalistic word, to talk to the, uh, to the patients and their families about returning to play. And I think it's impor an important piece, important piece of data in that article is the fact that the, there were actually 157 athletes who were diagnosed with long QT and only 130 went back to play. And I think that's important because it says to me that um, it's not that Mike just said, hey, go ahead and you know, have a good time. He really was talking to them about the risks and benefits, and some choose to, chose to go back and others did not. So I think it, it, it really speaks to the fact that there really was a, an informed decision-making process going on. So while that's the first time I think that, that, that word was used or that phrase has been used in, in the terms of athletes, this is something that obviously has been going on for a while. At the time we did our ICD study, we have 70, had 77 varsity athletes in that study. 
And at, they, they, were, they were all playing at a time when the guidelines said no way, no how. And so presumably their doctors had that conversation with them. I wasn't privy to those conversations, but I have to assume that the doctors talked to the patients about the risk and, and, and um, you know, uh, what their estimate of that risk was in, in the discussion of, of uh, the patients returning um, to play. It's also important to note that while the NICNAP decision allowed the school to make a paternalistic decision, it in no way mandated, it in no way, uh, it in no way um, enforced the concept that a school was mandated or even should follow the guidelines. And I'm going to read again from that ruling, quote, in closing, we wish to make clear that we're not saying Northwestern, that Northwestern's decision necessarily is the right one, then there's some legalese, and then it says, simply put, all universities need not evaluate uh, risk the same way. So it didn't, even back then, it didn't shut the door on shared decision making, it just said you don't, you don't have to do it. So the new 2015 AHA ACC eligibility criteria also don't use the word shared decision making anywhere, but the document encourages this in two ways. First of all, while the two, 20, uh, 2005 recommendations were a binary yes, no, the, uh, in, the tw in the 2015 version, there are lots of uh, disease entities that now carry class two. Class 2A two may be reasonable, class 2B may be considered recommendations. So for example, long QT in 05, which is just a no, but uh, patients just restricted to, to golf and bowling. But now long QT on ECG, symptomatic or asymptomatic, um, competitive sports, quote, may be considered after treatment, a symptom-free period, appropriate precautionary measures, et cetera. And ICD now is similarly a class 2B. So talking to a patient about a class 2 recommendation, in my mind, absolutely mandates a shared decision-making approach. You need to talk about what the data are, where the data are lacking, and what are the risks. Why did the experts feel that, why is it that the experts felt that it might be considered but might not be recommended? Where, where, where is that coming from? So, and further, in many places, the 2015 document um, specifically does describe um, the role of counseling of the athlete. So, for example, in the long QT recommendations, talk about a three-month waiting period. That's partly for initiation of medication, but it also specifically says for the, uh, for the, the athlete to undergo uh, counseling. Even in the HCM section, so the bold face recommendation in the HCM section is basically no, no, and what is there about no you don't understand. But buried in the fine print of the text, it says, quote, there will always be tolerance in the system for some degree of flexibility, individual, individual responsibility, and choice. Um, how the law will interpret class two guidelines, we don't know yet. It's only been out for a year. Um, I actually uh, called in a, uh, someone who's an experienced sports lawyer to ask them what they thought the law would say about a class two recommendation in, in relation to the situation I knew of. And uh, basically the lawyer said, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see what the courts have to say. This is exactly why I did not go into the law, because I think there ought to be an answer when you ask, you know, when you have a question. I think in medicine, we don't always know the answer. For example, does ECG screening save lives? We don't know for sure, but we know the answer is there, and if we had enough money to do a large enough, long enough study, we would get the answer. But when it comes to the law, I guess we just have to wait and see. I'm hoping that with shared decision making gaining more and more acceptance, maybe the court will never end up having to be decided uh, by the law. So how do I talk to an athlete and a family diagnosed uh, with, uh, with a cardiac disease who wants to return to play? So first, it obviously depends on the situation, and I'll get to some examples, but first I talk about the data, what do we know, what don't we know, the risks, um, what are the guidelines, how good are the data, how big are the studies. Talking about risk is inherently very difficult. Um, there is a whole field devoted to the psychology of how people think about risk. And I'm not an expert in this field. I think this field was actually developed by investment bankers because they want to get more money out of us and they're trying to get us to take more risk. But it really is related to, to risk taking and investments. But, it's this, but basically what all that data shows is that how we think about risk is very irrational. And I'll give a personal example. Um, some years ago, I don't know if people remember, there was a sniper in DC who was like picking people off. And I happened to be talking to a colleague who was a health economist around that time. And his son's high school class trip to DC had been canceled. Now he knew, and of course we all know, that the chance of getting killed in the car on the way to DC from Connecticut was a whole lot higher than the chance of having the sniper hit you. But that's not how people think. 
for another sort of quick mind experience, that this, is, this was a, a, something that actually was put to me for my own life at one point. If you had a procedure with a, if you were going to have a cho chance of two procedures, would you rather undergo the procedure that has a 1 in 30 risk of a serious complication or the one in which you've got a 97% chance of a great outcome? Well, obviously they're exactly the same, but to me, one in 30 sounds really high, whereas like 97% sounds like no big deal. So it's really very irrational. So I try to give people ways to think about risk, which I admit to them and to you are not based on science, but are just uh, what works for me. So I say it's hard to think rationally about risk, and sports, particularly contact sports, are not risk-free in themselves. And there's no number that we can say, this is an acceptable risk and this is not. Different families and different individuals think about risk in very different ways. So I remember a few years ago reading about a 16-year-old girl who was going to sail around the world single-handedly. So obviously she didn't buy that boat herself. Her parents must have been all for it. And you know I certainly wouldn't have my 16-year-old sailing across the world by herself, but some families do. On the other hand, there are some families who don't let their children play football because of the known risks. I probably would. I have a daughter, but I would, if she wanted to play football, I would certainly um, let her go ahead. And I, what I say to a family, I say, where in that spectrum your, you, you or your child falls as far as the specific number, we can't really, we can't really say. But you, is it closer to sailing around the world single-handed or is it closer to playing football? But as a family thinking about risk tolerance, you have to think about are you closer to the person who would let your child sail around the world or climb Mount Everest or are you closer to the person who might not let your kid play football and so that's at least a, a way to start to uh, think about it and I also feel I need to remind people that while obviously it's better to do something that's low risk than something that's high risk if it happens to you it doesn't really matter whether you were 1 in 99 or 1 in 99,000 so the fact that the other 99,000 people didn't have this bad thing doesn't really help you if you're the one. And so I think it's important to, uh, to think about that. So to get to a few examples, well, an easy example, I think at this point, would be a soccer player has a cardiac arrest, diagnosed with long QT, gets an ICD, treated with beta block or cardiac sympathetic innervation, whatever. So this person is going to have a fairly straightforward conversation. We talk about the guidelines. I talk about the data. This is considered by current recommendations to be something where it may be considered. The data are pretty good that the risk is low. We had this many people in our study of whom there were ex-soccer players, ex-long QT, ex-varsity athletes. So you really would, would fit among this group. We had no bad outcomes. And then I say the study was large, but it wasn't huge. The fact that we had no bad outcomes doesn't mean the risk is zero we're able to say statistically based on our numbers that the risk is less than 1%. So just because no one had a bad outcome in our study doesn't mean the risk is zero. So then you have to talk about the specifics, the, the waiting period, you talk about precautions, hydration, that type of thing I won't get into uh, now, the medical uh, aspect of it. For a patient with an ICD, I talk about shocks. In our study, um, we did have a fair number of athletes who were shocked during sports, but we had a similar number who were shocked during other physical activity, just mowing the lawn or whatever, and we also had plenty of people who were shocked at rest. So I talked to the patient, shocks do hurt, and you have to decide for yourself whether that risk is something you're worth taking, is worth taking to you. In our study, um, most of the patients who got shocked during sports did go back, so for them, the trade-off was worth it, but you know, say to the patient, that's something that only a person can know for themselves whether that trade-off is worth it. Now, if it's a football player or a rugby player, the conversation is a little bit different. I then talk about what data we have, what data we don't have. Well, in our study, we had a lot of basketball and soccer players, which are considered contact sports by the American Academy of Pediatrics, but we really just had a very few number of really violent contact sports, such as uh, football or rugby. And so, you know, I tell the patient, I say, well, you know, I think it's, we can probably extrapolate that the risk of the defibrillator not working is similarly low to a soccer player, but it's certainly possible that uh, the risk of device damage might be higher. So you really have to talk about what, what we know and, uh, and what we don't know. Um, for the ARVC patient, that conversation is straightforward, but it's really the hardest conversation we have because you just have to talk about the data. You have to say, well, the data are not perfect. The studies are pointing to the likelihood that the triathlons you're doing are going to make this get a whole, uh, get a whole lot worse and uh, may lead you to have heart failure. In our study, uh, we did have patients with ARVC. This was, uh, we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, in our study, we didn't um, encourage or discourage sports. We just looked at people who had made that decision. 
So we did have ARVC patients. They got shocked. The ICDs worked. They did get more shocks than uh, the other patients. They were more likely to have storms with physical activity. But more importantly, I say to the patient, you don't want to get heart failure. And if you continue doing triathlons, your heart failure is going to come on a whole lot sooner. You're going to feel poorly. You're going to die sooner. You're not going to be able to do the things that you want to do. So that is a, it's a discouraging conversation. You know, you can say to the patient, the good news is there's something you can do about this cardiomyopathy, which often there isn't. But that's sort of a poor consolation for most of these athletes who really want to continue to play. For the HCM patient, the discussion is very different, and it's also different whether or not they have a defibrillator. So regardless, for the HCM patient, you start talking about the fact that in the current guidelines, it says class one that they should be restricted um, based on what is, uh, remains expert opinion. Now, if they do have an ICD, you can talk about the data. In our study, we had a lot of HCM patients. They all did uh, well. So we can have that conversation if they do have an ICD. If they don't have an ICD, you're really uh, having a, a fairly blind conversation. You just have to say, uh, we don't know the risks. Um, the risks are undefined. And, and you kind of have to go from there. And you have to mention that there's no data one way or the other on progression of disease in, in HCM. So spend a lot of time talking about what data there are, uh, there are, what data there aren't. For HCM, I'll put in a, a quick plug. We actually have an ongoing study called Live HCM, where we're enrolling patients uh, at all levels of activity, from ac that vigorous exercisers to the sedentary, to look at some of these questions. Do the vigorous exercisers have a higher risk of uh, arrhythmic endpoints than the sedentary? Our, our hypothesis is that they don't. It's a non-inferiority. So if you have patients uh, with HCM that might, you think might like to participate, they can enroll directly through our, our, uh, our study center. Just a, a quick plug. So um, the bottom line is to talk about the data, talk about the guidelines. It's a long conversation. It's a, it's a good conversation, and, and that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Do you want to join us? Yeah, right? sure. okay. Thanks, Dr. Lambert. That was great. Um, I'm going to ask you the first question and, and tie in with shared decision-making conversations. So in the difficult ones that I've had personally where I've recommended restriction, um, we heard a little bit earlier about follow-up. They never follow up with me because I didn't give them the answer that maybe the athlete wanted to hear. So um, do you... Um, What's been your experience in similar, similar situations, and do you try to follow up, especially if you had a reason to restrict, uh, follow up with the family and or the patient, and how do you go about that? Um, so more of the patients as an electrophysiologist that I see, I'm not restricting because they're ICD patients or long QT. Um, for the ARVC patients that I, I see, actually they are willing to follow up because I think for those it's a straightforward conversation. Um, for, uh, so I think even though that's not what they want to hear, they do hear it, and so I have found that they do pay attention. So I haven't, I haven't, I don't, I don't know that I've had that, that problem specifically. So is it fair to say that you only restrict ARVC patients, of the patients that you see being an EP? Well, that is, it's an, it's an easier question for me as an EP, and the reason for that is, um, the patients that I see tend to either have long QT or ICDs. The hardest group is certainly the HCM patient without the ICD, and I don't see as many of those. So I would, I would have, I, I would have that conversation. I would lean toward, and again, it's a, it's not a letting we are you going to let them play. You know, I think if you um, talk about the unknown risk. Um, if they don't, so what, what do we know about HCM? Well, we know in arrhythmic risk in HCM, we know that we have two different types of risk calculators. We've got the European risk calculator, we've got the standard sort of Marin for, um, you know, for uh, risk factors plus gadolinium. Um, so if someone has none of those, if, if someone has some of those, they're going to get an ICD, and so then they're going to fall in a group where you can feel comfortable saying yes. And if they don't have all of those, it's probably a fairly low risk. But we don't, you know, again, you have to share, we don't know. I have a, I don't think this is on. Is the mic, is the mic on in the center? Test, test, oh it is down, thanks. So I, that kind of brings up a question. If you were a smart patient and you were looking at the literature and you had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 
um, you would say, well, gosh, this literature says that if I had a defibrillator, I can play. And th this literature says that since I don't have a defibrillator, I can't play. Doctor, give me a defibrillator. I mean, because when I went to EP school, we were taught not to do that. But the literature would suggest this patient might ask that question. Do, do you want so the guidelines, the HCM guidelines uh, from AHA, I think in 13, very specifically say you should not implant a defibrillator um, for that reason. And I think that um, it's, it's a difficult question. And that's what our current study is hoping to answer is that very hard group. Because certainly defibrillator is not risk free. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're low risk and we all put them in um, all the time. But, um, uh, they do have complications, and uh, to just give someone that for that reason, I think, um, would be a, a tough call. Um, so, you know, I say I, I've been sort of taken out here and say hopefully uh, in a couple years we'll have that answer. Now, we have patients in our study who have HCM and uh, don't have defibrillators and are active. So, through whatever combination of the the doctor and the patient and the family risk-taking um, uh, equation, people are doing it. And so it was sort of the same place that we were with the ICDs when we started our ICD study. Um, so, I, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have that information in a, in a couple years. Um. Is uh, when you're having these discussions with individuals, uh, do you take into account the genetic variants or do you take in family history of sudden cardiac death in your discussions? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Do you take into account uh, the, the specific genetic abnormality for, these for a, the, a particular condition? For HCM, we don't have that data yet. That's some, we're, we're collecting that data on, uh, if it, particularly if it turns out that there are individuals for whom exercise is uh, arrhythmogenic more, more than others. Um, we, we are looking at whether we can identify factors um, that do predict it. So um, it's possible that it will turn out that, that exercise is not arrhythmogenic. There's a, a paradox of exercise that is known for the general population. And that paradox of exercise says that exercise is a trigger. We know that, more, that people die during exercise. And this is just for the general middle age, any adult population. We know that you're more likely to die during exercise. And even if you are a marathon runner, you're more likely to die during exercise. But we also know that marathon runners overall are less likely to die. So to me, it's not a paradox. It's really just how the autonomic nervous system works. If you are in good physical condition, you're less likely to die. But even if you, if you are going to die, you're more likely to die when your catecholamines are highest. So for the athlete, that's when they're doing their marathon. If you're not an athlete, that might be when you're running for the bus. So, um, whether, so we may see a similar finding for genetic cardiovascular disease, that the athletes actually are less likely to have arrhythmias, even though when they do have them, they're during exercise. So that's a, that's a question that we'll, we'll need to learn. The second part of that question was whether you take into account family history of sudden cardiac death in your discussions. Sorry, can you repeat that, sir? I'm sorry, that I, microphone I doesn't said, seem to work too well. Do you take into account a history of sudden cardiac death in the family in your discussions? Do you take into history yeah. of oh, okay. sudden cardiac death in the family? Well, for any given disease, you're working with a set of risk stratifiers. So the first, before you're talking about athletics at all, um, you're talking about standard risk stratification. Do you know what I mean? So lots of people are going to get defibrillators just because they meet the criteria due to, to, to standard clinical, uh, clinical known factors. And so I think that piece of it is coming in more there, probably. And, and a final comment about ARVC in our population, that's in Newfoundland, Canada. Um, the only women who have this problem in a young age are those who are athletes. So I totally agree with your statement that uh, physical activity in those patients once identified genetically is disadvantageous for them. Did you catch that one? Thank you.
I'm going to jump to the social Q&A and then we'll come back to the uh, mic. Um, one of the questions is, if the ECG is abnormal, was the best test to follow up uh, with the patient, a Holter stress test, echo stress test, or other? Dr. Cannon. It depends on why it's abnormal. I mean, it, 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 there's a, the, the problem is, is that we don't know what the best test of cascade is. And then, for example, if you had T wave inversion in V1 through V5, if you have a pectus, that may be completely normal. If you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you may see that. If you have ARVC, you may see that. So the question is, is do you test now and then do you repeat in two years? What test do you repeat in two years? Do you repeat in four years? What test do you repeat in four years? So it really depends on the specific clinical situation and scenario as far as what you do. I think a lot of us don't know. I mean, Francisco. No, no, I, I, I agree perfectly with, with you that it depends on the, the scenario. And uh, b because uh, the, the, the ECG alter uh, may be useful in order to quantify the, the entity the, of the arrhythmic event, uh, uh, the, the stress echo and, and, uh, and other, uh, and other uh, finality. And uh, I, I agree with you, depend on the context, depend on the uh, modification, the, 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 the the change that we uh, find on, uh, on SG. Right, but l let's say, let's try to see if we can generalize a little bit, because I think we're being very, very, very specific to the knowledge that we have, but there are so many screening studies out there. So if you see an abnormality on the ECG, and let's say it's not, not WPW, okay. so what would be typically the pathway that you would do? What are the the common test but, that but the, 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 the common test is uh, echo and f for SEG, the, the two. And, and stress uh, okay, test. Okay, okay. Yes, stress yeah, test. Right. Okay, stress right. test and echo. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think that typically, okay. probably, okay. the disease is the, 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 and then a stress test. But obviously, it may depend on what the finding is. Let's go back to the mic. Uh, yes, as a physician that practices sports cardiology most of the time, I, I want to thank you for the work you do. Uh, uh, my name is Larry Rink from Indiana University, and, and uh, Rachel in particular, what you've done with athletes that basically it allows some of them to participate now who, who have AICDs, um, I think it's important. Uh, a comment I'd make, Nick, Nick Knapp, because I was his physician and I still am his physician, and it brings up a point, uh, Nick Knapp did have sudden death, um, but there was never an etiology found. Uh, you know, he had heart cas, EP studies, uh, and he did have an AICD. So would Nick Knapp be allowed to play basketball today, having had sudden death, but have a totally negative workup and an AICD in place? Well, I think that gets to the question of what is what would a court do with a class two recommendation? So now he would fall purely under the ICD uh, recommendation. He doesn't have an underlying disease that has its own class. So he would be a class two B, um, uh, uh, competitive, highest level com competition can be considered. So I think most doctors would probably say yes, assuming you're comfortable with this small risk that you can go back and, you know, in the, in the role that a doctor has to be a yes or no decider, um, I think most doctors probably would say yes, but whether schools would or not, I don't think we know the answer. I think uh, these, these class two, you know, the guidelines that includes class two only are a year old. And so uh, where things are going to go with it, I, I, we don't know. I would hope that he, between the data that we have and, and this now class two, I would hope that he would be allowed to play today, but I think uh, it, it hasn't been tried. Yeah, my takeaway from that case was that universities have a right to say who can play for them and who can't on medical basis, because I really think that's what happened. And then the second thing to pertain to what you say, in the athletes I counsel, uh, some of them pro athletes, uh, where they cannot participate, but particularly the younger ones that can't, there's, there's almost always a difference of opinion between the parents. One parent wants them to play, one parent doesn't. And in my experience, I would bet 50% of those marriages end up in a divorce uh, related. And that, that's a fact. And so well, you think a tough, about yeah, that when you counsel situation. your athletes. <laughs> 
You know, it's interesting, in, in Mike Ackerman's uh, paper, he actually, I think it's actually in the paper, both in order for him to give the go-ahead, both parents, not only because these were his children, both parents actually had to agree in that long QT uh, study. Yeah, I think Susan brought up an excellent point. This is a moving target because we are going to get people when we talk about shared decision making that say, my decision is that I want an ICD and then I want to play. And we're going to be put in situations where now we have a whole new set of issue of problems yeah. of people are saying, well, you're telling me I can't play without an ICD, then give me an ICD even though I don't meet standard qualifications. So it's going to open up a whole other Pandora's box that we're going to have to deal with. A lot of yeah. Okay. Last question. Um, role of genetic screening after a positive screen, I presume, a, let's say a positive ECG screen. Is there a role? What's the role of genetics? It depends, right? I, I'm going to yeah, yes. put the giant asterisk to say it, it depends on what it is. And the other problem that we're going to run into is genetic screening is not a panacea. If you look for genetic screening for ARVC, Placophyllin 2 is one of the most common genes that we see, but the background noise within the population is 5%. So if you order that test 5% of the time in people who don't have it, you're going to see background noise. So the problem is we don't have definitive testing for these kinds of uh, things. Long QT syndrome, you know, will maybe pick up 80% of patients who, ha who, who have the genetic disorder, but right now there's not great genotype, phenotype correlations. can sometimes be helpful in making a diagnosis, but in general, it's, it's not the be-all, end-all. But, but w w when uh, uh, we suspect that uh, channelopathies, uh, I think that the, the gene screening is, uh, is uh, definitely in order to evaluate. After we can also observe no correlation between the genetic pattern and the phenotypic pattern, but uh, in, in the form that may have a genetic uh, base, we can do it. Wonderful. Well, um, once again, thank you very much for all your participation and thank you all for staying here today. I was just going to mention, if you guys are interested in uh, exercise and sports, please um, participate in our section of sports uh, cardiology and exercise. I think that there is a uh, wealth of content and experts that are available to take a look at your ECG or answer your question. I also would invite you all to come to um, Salt Lake City um, in June when we're going to have the Athletic Heart. We will have a three-hour uh, ECG session on the international, newly published international uh, criteria for um, athletes uh, on ECG reading, obviously, uh, in addition to having, again, Dr. Lamter talking about shared decision making and uh, a sports psychologist as well participating. So uh, please come and join us in June. Thank you very much. Thank you.